My name is Frederick. I'm going to talk about multi-core Java C and how you integrate Java C with big projects, in particular make files, but also a little bit about Ant. And I've been working on JRocket for the last six or seven years. And since JRocket was uh, being merged with uh, Oracle Hotspot, I've been working on Hotspot for the last two years. Now, we will start with an easy question. From a single Java source file, what do you get when you compile something? Sounds simple, doesn't it? But in fact, it's quite complicated. Because you can get anything from zero to an infinite number of classes. And they might not even correlate with the file name of your source file. And this is unfortunately perfectly according to the standard. So you have package info files that contain no actual code, and they generate no class files. They are only there to generate javadoc. You have inner classes and package private files, and they generate files that you cannot really predict the, source, uh, the file name of. And you have uh, classes at the end of your public class in that file, and those also are unpredictable. And in fact, if you're using an annotation processor with its such a pre-processing support in Java C, it gets even worse because then anything can happen. So the net result is you don't know what's going to happen when you run Java C. So Java C requires explicit source file names on the command line. And usually you put a lot of source files into the at file. And these explicit sources are always compiled and linked against the dependencies outside of it. For example, the class path, where you pick up the object class, and other things. Now, if you link or need access to code that has not yet been compiled, you need to use the source path argument to Java C. How many of you here has ever used the minus source path? Oh, six, seven, that's great. Uh, so you use source path to pick up code that you are dependent upon, but for some reasons you have not been able to compile that part yet. And unfortunately, the default behavior for source path is to actually generate code that Java C accidentally finds there while it's linking your code. So even though you didn't explicitly say that this class should be written to disk, it will do so for you. Unless, of course, you specify implicit none. And then it will not write unexpected classes to disk for you. Or, and this is a minor nit that most of you have not experienced, it will actually not recompile things on your source path class if you have classes in your boot class path with a newer timestamp what's on the disk. So for example, if you, were, if you are a JAXP developer, and you have the JAXP sources on your disk, and you have used source path to access JAXP, it might very well happen that uh, Java C will ignore your sources and pick the ones from the boot class path, because the boot class path had a newer timestamp because you downloaded the JDK yesterday. This is very confusing, but most people do not experience this kind of problem. So we, we can see that we have runtime linking, we have compile time linking, and we ha have uh, compile time linking against sources. Unfortunately, when Java C goes out to source path, it will not just look at the APIs of these sources, it will actually compile them. And this is one of the reasons why it's so easy to make circular dependencies in Java. Because Java goes out of the way for you to spit things out on disk that you didn't ask for, but it's needed anyway for this circular dependency to work. So you can write circular dependencies in code very easily and you don't even notice. For example, you have A depends on B, that depends on C, that depends on A. You explicitly tell the compiler, I want to compile A and B. And if you have the source path, it will fill in C for you. Well, 
you probably want to do that anyway. Unfortunately, this makes it very difficult for you to see these dependencies, which of course causes uh, the need for all of these nice tools which draw the circular nest of spaghetti that represents your dependencies afterwards. Um, yeah. So usually implicit compilation is not a problem because most people do not develop code that's inside the JDK, but implicitly generated classes contribute to this confusion that I started with. We don't know what Java C is generating. And why is, why is this a problem? Well, it is a problem when we start to integrate Java with make files or we want to do proper incremental builds and keeping things clean. Because, for example, another problem with Java C is that it doesn't clean up after itself. So if you compile a class, it will write implicit stuff to disk or explicit stuff or inner classes or anything, and then you remove the inner class, and it will not remove the class file from disk. And this is very annoying. So most people are already quite used to doing make clean, and clean, <laughs> something like that. You just get rid of it. So as soon as things start misbehaving, you just clean it out and try again. But I don't think it should be like that. So let's examine what the current Java C creates for problems when you want to write a make file for it. I know, how many of you have actually written make files? Yes, that's why I knew you would come here. The only session with a title that contains the word makefile. Everyone else just runs away scared. So you have the makefile. It's an imperative program. It runs through from top to bottom. And while it does that, it creates a tree of goals and requirements. So after it's run through it the first time, nothing has really happened, but you have a tree of goal requirements. And then it will pick a goal, usually the one you gave on the command line, or the first one in the file, and it will recurse through this tree and decide which actions to evaluate to actually generate the goal. So the make, make is very powerful because you have first this imperative program that can both, in this case, generate flags and put flags into actions, but it, you can also create the goal requirement rules from within make as an imperative program. So you should think of it as a two-step process, first an imperative program, then an evaluation of the generated tree. So in this simple example, we have the goal, which is the app, the sources to app, compile the sources, and yeah. And make will, of course, uh, look at the timestamps of the requirements and the goal to decide if a goal is already complete. Now, since make can generate goal requirements uh, dependencies from the imperative code, we can create macros that set up dependencies. So even though most of you think make as rather inconvenient to do big uh, configurations, this is an example that I will explain a little bit more later that uses a macro to set up, set up an entire dependency from uh, the Java source code to the output classes, and then you depend on the output source and you depend on the class jar. So this first part here, this macro, it doesn't do anything. It just sets up all the dependencies. And to actually get something out, you bind the all goal to these uh, targets. However, as you might have guessed, it's not that easy to write that macro. And if we look at the Java C command line, this is an example that it might look if you wanted to compile the JDKs, because what I'm talking about here is our own product, Hotspot. How do we compile the JDK? So what you see here is you say Java C, boot class path classes, minus D classes, and then source Java Lang object, source Java Lang character data, and 8,000 more files. This clearly doesn't work because there is no command line in any OS that accepts this amount of data on the command line. Uh, so we can use an at file 
to work around the problem, but everything here means that we need an external tool to help us configure Java C to build, build projects. And as you all know, the ANT is the standard tool. And we have properties where we have the source, build and dist. We have an init goal that creates a build directory. We have a compile goal that compiles the source. And here you can see that the ant task has already prepared for us, so we only need to point to the source and the target. So we don't need to list all the files. Sensible. And then it generates a jar. So if I want to write a make file to do the same thing, I can't use the logic in make that I usually depend on because I don't know what the goal is going to be. Normally, if you, the first time you start thinking about writing a makefile for Java, you say, okay, I want to create this class, and I do this uh, pattern transformation that create, transforms uh, percentage.class into percentage.java, and then you compile the Java files to generate the class files, and, and you're done. But unfortunately, it's impossible because you don't know what classes are going to be generated. So Java, Java C has been incompatible with makefiles from the beginning and in the 90s because it's it's impossible to set up rules for it. So what we have to do is to fake. So the make file begins by setting a few um, variables. In this case, uh, colon equals means evaluate the shell command at this spot in the make file, so we don't need to reevaluate it later. Find all the Java files. We set up a goal. In this case, we know what we're creating because the jar file is the output of jar. That's easy. So we said the goal jar depends on the build, but what is the build? The build is just a fake file, a little small file that's touched. And its only purpose is to remember to timestamp in correlation to the sources. So when make runs this file a second time, it will see that the timestamp of the build is newer than all the timestamps for all the sources and say, OK, it's done. I don't need to rerun this action. But if any sources is touched or changed or anything, it will have a time spent newer than the build file, and it will re-trigger the generation of the classes. OK, looks simple enough. No incremental compile. So you have this JDK. It's got 8,000 classes or more. Or you've got an even bigger product. There are many, many products that are larger than the OpenJDK. It will always compile everything. That's very inconvenient. There is no incremental jar update. So the jar will accumulate everything all the time. No classes are ever cleaned away. And there is a limit on the number of source files on the command line. So you can't really, this doesn't work. It looks easy, but it doesn't work. So the two major obstacles with make files in Java is you don't know what's going to generate. And you have so many more Java files than you have C files and C++ files, which is, of course, because standard Java programming granularity is you have many small Java files instead of big C files. So it's never going to fit. So what are we going to do? It doesn't matter if you use AND to make, because we cannot fix this outside of Java C. It's Java C that is a problem. And the only way to get proper dependency tracking from Java C is to write your own Java C. <laughs> and unfortunately, quite a lot of people have done that. But it's, it's a definitely a waste of time. And it doesn't matter if you use AND to make. You cannot get multi-core support because Java C is single-threaded, inherently single-threaded. So, and this is just not possible to fix from outside of Java C. So one and a half year ago, when I started looking at the build system for the OpenJDK, I started thinking about, let's fix AND so that we can do this thing. And I looked into AND, and I eventually found, well, it's just a wrapper to call Java C. And it only took a week to determine that, OK, now I have to do something with Java C. 
Unfortunately, since I work for Oracle, that's actually a possibility. And yeah, we have a few attempts at fixing this from ant, for example, ant depend. But ant depend can only look at the class files because they didn't bother writing their own Java C compiler, which is perfectly understandable. So they can only see dependencies that are exist in the class file. And in the class file, you lost quite a lot of dependency information, like where did the final static information come from, for example. And yes, there is a fork in ant, but it doesn't help you because it can't fork the Java C task by itself. You can only start two Java C tasks manually. Okay, so IDEs, yeah, sure, they are good at maintaining dependencies. They already have a database. They already have their own compilers as an Eclipse compiler. So they do that perfectly. Uh, but they still haven't figured out to do multi-core compilations. And of course, we need ant and make for batch compiles. So one and a half year ago, my first attempt to fix Java C was to add a few things to Java C and do the rest in make. So the things I added was a server functionality, a daemon, which is quite common. A lot of people have done that to get around the problem with Java C's huge startup time. Java C is really fast compiler, but the startup time is uh, tremendous because first you start a JVM, it's going to load the class path and everything that's needed to run Java C. Then it starts interpreting Java C. And while it's running the interpreter, it's loading all the classes again from the class path. And perhaps at that time, it starts optimizing the Java C compiler. And then it starts loading your source code and starts compiling it. So it's, when it's reached that point, then it's really fast. But <laughs> before that, it takes a lot of time. So the first thing you want to do is to add a server. And then I added an option to output dependency information so that I didn't need to parse the Java source code myself because it's trivial to add this kind of dependency tracking inside Java C. It's just one single line in one specific place. I created a, an output for natives to see which classes do contain native methods so that I wouldn't need to manually list all the classes that contain native methods. And I added and switched to output a public API of a package because the public API is what's important when you want to propagate recompilation. If a recompilation of a package does not change the public API, yeah, then you don't need to recompile any dependent packages. But if the public API is changed, yes, then you need to recompile the dependence. And yes, in this first prototype, Make was responsible for splitting all the work tasks into many, many cores. And it threw each Java package randomly in some order that Make decided onto the Java C server. Believe it or not, it actually worked. <laughs> but it, uh, what did the Make file look like behind that nice macro that I showed you earlier? Well, it looked like something like this. If you can't see it, don't be sad. But how do you figure out what Java C is generating? Well, you have to remember you do a list after the previous compile, store that into a text file, clean out the class files, compile again, do a list again, and then do grep minus xvf to do a set subtraction between those text files to get out the differences between the previous compiler and the new compiler to get out which class files disappeared so I can delete them from the jar. So it's like, um, yeah, and this, this little part where it says substitute slash backslash dollar 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 slash backslash dollar 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 backslash dollar 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 slash that's a result of the fact that all inner class files contains the, the character dollar, which is the worst character ever to put into a file. Name. But we, we now we have them there, so it's, it's, uh, the dollar character is an escape character on every single level from the file system up to bash. So you've got bash, sed, make, all of those treat 
dollar as an escape character. So you need to escape it on each level. That's why you have twelve dollars in a row there. <laughs> now it took a while to get that right. <laughs> okay, this is clearly not sustainable, even though it's hidden behind a nice macro call. So the logical way is, of course, to increase the size of the changes to Java C. So now I'm calling these changes uh, the smart Java C wrapper. And of course, this is in anticipation of that this feature as actually gets into the official Java C. Because clearly we want incremental builds and multi-core in Java C. But it will take a while for us to get it stable enough and agree on the command line options and things like that. Uh, so, but, so it's called Smart Java C Wrapper in the meantime. It's going to be pushed, and it's already pushed into the public uh, repositories of the build infra team. So you can play with it today if you want to. Uh, and the command line for the Smart Java C Wrapper is simply you point to the source route and you point to the destination route. Very simple. Now there are many other options as well, but this is the basic functionality. It will recurse down into your source tree, find all the files, split them up in separate cores, compile them, extract all the dependencies, and write all the dependency information, the timestamp information, the public API information into this Java C state file. And the default location is just classes slash Java C state. You can move it if you want to. It forces implicit num. And I will explain why. So it supports multiple cores using a very uh, oh, silly implementation, but it actually gives 20% improvement in speed. We can improve that later. And this uh, Java C wrapper source needs new hooks inside Java C. So I've added hooks into Java C that enables code to uh, um, subclass, for example, resolve and Java compiler in the Java C compiler to add this functionality. So it's a minimal intrusive change to Java C, so we can test this without worrying about breaking Java C. Now this is actually the part in the OpenJDK makefile that we use today. And here you can see the goal is called the batch. Now this is for plain Java C. And you can see the sources and other depends. It creates the, make, uh, the dir, output dir. It uses list pass safely to get out to create this at file. I remember there was a problem with the command line length. And to get uh, 10,000 Java source files out to this file is a problem. So one way to do it is to do a macro. And then this is the, the actual compilation of the entire JDK. We run the JVM on the Java C specification. The at file here is this uh, batch file. We put on the flags, the output, and the header args. So that's how, how the new build census uses plain Java C. And smart Java C is very similar. The only difference here is that it uh, adds uh, remote arguments to find the server. The smart Java C arguments, within this you have the minor source pointer to the source. It permits unidentified artifacts, and this is a, a temporary solution because in the old build you had this submodule writing to the same class output and this submodule writing to the same class output. So you had many different modules just writing down to the same location on disk, which of course made it totally impossible to track which class came from where. So, so and this still happens sometimes in the, in the build. So normally the smart Java C wrapper is very, very careful. And if it sees a class file that shouldn't be there, it will delete it because it wants to keep its garden clean. So it uh, cleans out. But this is, a, uh, for the moment, it's acceptable. The next, te next test here is just a, a paranoia test that compares a list of source files with the list that make generated. Because 
the smart Java C wrapper will of course recurse and find its source files by itself. Uh, but we want to be sure that we calculated the same make file, uh, source files in make. Yeah, and then you have the same thing. And yeah, I would like uh, both the present, and that's a new function in, in make uh, to get around the command line link limit. Now, your future make file on your side should be this simple. You specify how you run Smart Java C. You specify how you found the sources. You say the goal is the Java C state. Depends on the sources. Then you run Smart Java C on the source, minus H, headers, and destination to begin. This is simple. So Smart Java C takes care to make sure that the Java C state file timestamp is updated whenever it recompiles anything. This is, of course, an unavoidable side effect because it writes information into that file, but it's, it's important that it does that. So it gets the same effect. So make will, will very quickly scan all the source files for the timestamps and compare with the Java state. And then if everything is OK, nothing needs to be done very quickly. If something has changed, make will start a smart Java C wrapper. The smart Java C wrapper will boot up and it will redo the scan after it's read in the Java C state file. Well, it has to do that. It will take significantly longer than the scan made by make because the smart Java C wrapper is probably still interpreted by the JVM, but it's okay. We know that we're going to do some work, so it's okay that we spend a little bit of time on this. And it will find out which source file changed, calculate uh, the package to compile, compile that package, propagate dependencies, recompile other packages. Ah, we have not had time to fix jar yet. So in our build system, we still have unreadable make code to deal with the incremental updating of jars. But it would be nice if jar actually could delete class files if it uh, didn't need them anymore. For ant, we will write a smart Java C task and just replace Java C task with smart Java C task. So uh, with ant, you always have the startup time of the JVM and uh, the scan of the directories. So starting ant to detect if an incremental build is necessary will always be slower than running make, but that's the cost of running uh, Java. Uh, just for your information, you might be curious what's inside the Java C state file. And it's, for the moment, it's a very trivial uh, text file. Um, might be optimized later on, but uh, for debugging reason, it's very nice to have it in text. So it uh, lists the command line, which is minus source source minus dbin. It starts with a package, comes on Java internal runtime. And then it has a source and a timestamp. And this package depends on Java Lang and Java HTML. Piece of cake. It's really easy to get this information out of Java C. But if you're outside of Java C, it's not fun. Then you have the public API information for scanner. It's got a public method, which is abstract next token. And you have a public variable sim. And the artifact that was generated was scanner.class. So everything here is what you need to actually do a proper incremental build. So why is now, now we've talked about incremental builds in relation to make files and ant. The other part that's really interesting is the multi-core part. How do we speed up things for the batch compiler when we build something from start? Well, it turns out that Java C is a little bit like a compiler that shaves, shaves all the files like a, a cheese slicer. So if you have each file like this, it will take the whole set of files that it wants to compile and slice them all thinly from the top. So it's really, and that's because everything is dependent on each other. So you have the object, it depends uh, well, you have a dependency not on double, but double depends on object, string. Oh, the arrow is wrong there. 
a double depends on object, string depends, double depends on string, and of course string depends on object. So you have all circular dependencies everywhere. And these dependencies currently are implemented in Java C compiler as a pass where it scans all the files at the same time. It's, it's not really possible to just cut that up. So the interface deals with all the linking and references to public APIs. Then it lowers things and it starts getting more detailed about the types, the type system, things like that. And eventually it gets to the emit phase where it has created a syntax tree, it has all the information, now it can just generate classes. And this part is actually possible to put on multiple cores, the emit phase. So, as I said, the, the current multi-core implementation in the Smart Java C wrapper that gives 20% speed improvement using three cores is uh, silly. <laughs> but it's, it's a proof of concept and it's, it actually works. And it uses the source path. So what it does is that it splits the different files in the JDK, which you can see here, com oracle net to Java util concurrent, that's 2,985 files. And then you have a Java Util Concurrent Atomic to Sun Nile channels SCTP, and then the rest. Just splits them alphabetically, tuk, 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 and then starts up three Java compilers and tries to compile. So clearly, there are dependencies from the other blocks to the first one because Java Lang object is clearly in the first circle because that's where it is. But the other two, we'll manage to compile anyway because we have pointed the source path to the source root. So whenever the compilation of the other chunks fail by, or would have failed, it will actually find the missing dependency, even though it wasn't explicitly mentioned on the command line, by going through the source path. So simple enough. And if we are lucky enough, there are enough unique files that do not point dependencies to everything all the time. So for those unique files, you actually win something because they are only going to be compiled on that particular core. So did it work? Yes, it gave 20% speed performance just doing this silly change. And of course, as you understand, object.java is compiled three times. It's unavoidable because it's always dependent. So a lot of files are compiled three times. So why three? Because four didn't give any more speed up on the JDK because there are not enough files. It didn't give a slowdown either, but it's so. Uh, and three gave a slightly better performance than two. So, mm. uh, so obvious improvements of this uh, very rudimentary algorithm of, is of course, if one of the compilers have shared a uh, compiler class, well, share it between the other compilers. And it might sound easy, but it's not that easy because uh, these data structures are really, really interlinked with each other, so it would be a little bit of work to figure out if you could just make a reference available to the other compilers or if you actually need to clone them or something. We don't know that, but it's, it's an obvious improvement. Uh, you can share loaded classes from the class path. So in this case, I'm building the class path because I'm building the JDK, but in normal cases, you build and you have a reference library, which is the JDK library. So when each Java compiler loads something from that reference library, well, it should obviously be shared between the compilers immediately. And we would like to add a emit on all cores. So just throw out emits on everything. I haven't done that yet. It will be very fun to try, see <laughs> how much faster it goes. Uh, unfortunately, it turns out that minus source path has a problem with the uh, Java code that's a little bit sloppy written. And that's the kind of Java code where you have a class that's appended to the end of your file. So the, the name of the class does not correspond to the source file. And as long as all the references to that hidden class are only from the main class in that file, everything is fine. But you can have a reference to that class from another source file. And then suddenly source path cannot find this dependency because it's hidden inside that source path. You don't know how to find the source to compile to find it. And this is uh, <laughs> it's rather interesting to see the mails on the uh, 
Java language lang tools team uh, where two people discuss whether this kind of classes are allowed or not according to the spec. <laughs> so the jury is still out on that one. Uh, but uh, it doesn't matter because practically they exist because Java C has allowed those kind of references uh, since the start. So we have to live with it. But uh, I added uh, a new lint option that warns for such classes. In the JDK, we have approximately 20 such references. So, yeah. It's a nice one. OK, so now we talked about Smart Java C, Make, and Ant. And as I said in the beginning, all of this work was triggered by a need, which was my own developer need when I'm developing the OpenJDK and the hotspot. And uh, the problem was that the build was very slow. So approximately one and a half year ago, I became upset with the current situation of the build system because it severely mm, hindered me in my work. And we had the problem with Java C, as I just explained, all the problems, the circular dependencies, undocumented side effects with the implicit classes going out from somewhere where they didn't expect, no working dependency propagation from C++ to Java to C++, and such lack of proper dependency propagation immediately prevents you from paralyzing the build because you don't know what depends on what really, so you can't really split things up. Yeah. And if you, if you got dependencies, then you can do incremental builds. And the old build system essentially lacked all of this. So to be an efficient developer on the open JDK sources, you have to know so much that you knew that, okay, I changed this source file over here. Then I need to go down into this make directory and type make here. Because then it will compile just this part here. And then I can copy this part over here into an existing build that I got from release engineering and test it. So <laughs> it, it was very difficult for new developers of the OpenDTK to quickly get into this process. And of course, OpenJDK is a complex product, no surprise there. But it has a Java compiler, Java C. It is a JVM, C++, and Java. It's a JDK, C and C++, and Java. And it has complex interdependencies. You have C and C++ code generated from Java code. That's a JNI headers, typically. Uh, you have Java code that's generated from headers that you extract from the operating system, for example. Uh, the frameworks in uh, the Mac OS operating system to get access to Cocoa. You have uh, X Windows headers that you extract and generate Java wrappers for. Uh, you have generated Java and C and C++ sources from all different places. The character set and break iterators to quickly iterate over. <laughs> You're smiling. Uh, <laughs> seems like you know something about that. But um, uh, those are generated. Uh, the NIO, native IO stuff, are also generated. So. And the new Java code sometimes needs a new Java compiler, sometimes not, and things like that. And sometimes, even worse, a new Java compiler needs a new JDK, which creates a very interesting bootstrapping problem, which is usually solved by um, copying the code from the JDK that the Java compiler needs to be linked to stripping out the contents and just leaving the public API of those classes and then compiling Java compiler with those on the source path. So that's, uh, that could have been solved if you had uh, made implicit compilation. Just look at the public API of classes so you wouldn't have to strip it then you. Yeah, the old build system, you had to set up environment variables a huge technical depth. So each developer created their own build script, and the knowledge how to set up this uh, build script was shared through a human peer-to-peer -peer network. And uh, in the new build system, uh, we created a configure script instead, 
which, when run, creates uh, the similar thing that uh, you previously had to do by, your hand, by hand yourself. So how to configure and build using the new build system? I won't even give us an example of the old build. You get the source. Then you go into a subdirectory, and this is temporary because uh, when we switch over permanently to the new build system, we will move the configure script to the root source directory. And you run configure, and then you type make. Well, that's how it should be. And when you're built, you have the built uh, JVM inside build, uh, a name of the type of build, JDK in Java. So you can start using that Java directly. If you want uh, the build output to look exactly like the one that you install when you unzip a package or something like that, you do make images. So make images uh, reshuffles uh, uh, the class files and creates uh, the rt.jar and it creates the tools jar and things like that. And then on Linux you can do make install and it will install into user local. And I'll see if I can make a short demo. So I run. Configure. And it tests for all sorts of things. And then I type make. Now it's building the Java C compiler. And it's located in a LangTools repository. You can see it, it's building using the old Java C, the bootstrap LangTools, which is the bootstrap Java C compiler. Now it's using the Bootstrap Java compiler, which is Smart Java C. And you can see that it's split up the sources to, on three cores. And now it's building Corba. And a lot of files are generated. Now it's splitting up Corba into three cores. Now it's building JAXP. This is pure Java. And it's creating JAR. Now it's building JAXWS. Now it's building the hotspot uh, uh, JVM. Now this will run past quickly, and it's only because I primed the C cache. So it doesn't really compile the C++ code here, because then I would have to wait five minutes. So but it, the C cache picks this up. You can see it took uh, sort of three seconds to compile just ver version.cpp. That's uh, rather interesting because uh, there is a significant speed difference between different C++ compilers. So we have CL on Windows is really fast. Clang is really fast. G++ is not so fast. And uh, so it's, uh, and this is G++, so. Now it's building the JDK. Here you can see the generated uh, uh, break iterators and NIO char sets. Now here, here is a big build that's actually building all the classes in the JDK. And as someone told me uh, two days ago here in the conference, uh, they had a customer whose Java source, oh, it's, it's done, uh, took six hours to build. So it's, uh, there are huge projects out there. So we clearly need to start looking at how to speed up Java C. And in this case, well, this was rather fast. Now, if we do touch. Uh, 
I think, yeah, I'll show it on the... Um, Yeah, this is the, the config script generates a, a file with variables uh, equivalent to the ones that you manually had created before. But this is uh, part of its contents. The, the configure script has a minus minus help, which is very nice, which means that you can get help on what kind of configuration options you have. And this is what I already show you. We skip that one. Ah, this is what happens when you do an incremental build with Smart Java C. You touch a source file, and as I showed you earlier in the talk, this will be detected by Make. It will respawn the Smart Java C, and it will compile the entire package that surrounds that Java source file. Why the entire package? Well, because uh, actually it doesn't give you any speed benefit of just compiling a single file. So the whole uh, concept of recompilation incrementally is based around packages. Uh, it makes the database slightly smaller. It can be extended to source files if you want to, but for the moment it's packages. So it recompiles that package and it's done in less than eight seconds. If I edit socket factory and add a public void foo method, then clearly I change the public API or not class and I remake and it will say package javaxnet pub api has changed and then it will recompile the dependencies as expected. So if you look at the build times on my workstation this is uh, the old build using the old make files and if we look at this one with a new smart java c and no c cache it will recompile all the C++ code. We can see that the lang tools is almost the same for all cases, and that's mostly because you need to use the old compiler to compile the new compiler. So it's the same. Corba went from 1 minute and 32 seconds down to 7 seconds. And here, and the main reason was that the Corba make files were badly written. They restarted Java C far too often. And as I said before, the cost of starting Java C is tremendous. So by only starting Java C once, you get a significant speed improvement. Uh, but here we are also using the smart Java C multi-core functionality. And we can see that in this case, when we have disabled the smart Java C wrapper, we get 16 seconds of compile time. So the smart Java C wrapper gives us a double build performance. Hotspot, it takes three minutes to compile uh, the C++ code. In this case, I get five minutes because I had enabled Ccache and it's empty. And there is a cost when you compile something for Ccache because it outputs all the pre-processed source code from the C++ headers. So that's why it's more costly. But on the other hand, when I recompile and I already have primed the Ccache, the recompile only takes one minute. And now it gets interesting. We have the JDK, it took 10 minutes. And when you're using Smart Java C and no C cache, it took one minute and 23 seconds. When the C cache is primed, we can see that uh, it took 50 seconds. So, um, and when we run without the C, uh, Smart Java C, we can see that it takes two minutes and nine seconds. So, this value should be compared with this value. And again, we see approximately a, a doubling of speed using the Smart Java C wrapper. Yeah, um, you have the total. So we have only started with multi-core. We will do more. And we have initial support for multi-core, as you saw. We have incremental builds with proper dependency tracking. We have added a new option to Java C that's called minus H that will automatically generate native C header files for you in a directory that you specify after minus H. 
if you compile files with uh, native method. In. A very simple option that should have been added 10 years ago. We have a new lint warning. And we have a much more inviting development environment. So it's interesting because uh, the need to build our own product, uh, the hotspot open JDK, faster spawn these side effects and we are not yet done. So we have improved Java C on two cases that will be part of JDK 8 probably. Uh, the smart Java C stuff is not going in JDK 8, will be later on. What we want to do is to be pushed so it's part of the official build. We want incremental jar updates should be relatively simple. Need to write a smart Java C task for Ant should also be simple. And something uh, that I discovered two days ago here in this conference, it would be very nice to have a public API tracking for classes and jars on the class path. Because if you imagine that you have a huge product and you compile 20 different jars and then you compile your app and you do a, an incremental compile and you update it to yours, but you don't know what part of your app actually depends on those jars and what's inside your jars. So if you can just compile in your app those parts that depends on the changed APIs in those jars, that would be very convenient. And it's also a very simple change to add. I just haven't done it yet because I, we got the idea two days ago. So that's it. Thank you very much. And I'm amazed that so many people were here listening to make files of everything in the world. <laughs> Any uh, questions? Yes. Yeah, I've got two questions. The first question is, on how many cores have you managed? What's the maximum number of cores that you've made that it, that it uh, kept busy with the compiler? Well, it keeps busy, but it doesn't give you a speedy format. Because it's uh, uh, since uh, it's busy compiling all those uh, shared dependencies that all need. So, for example, oh, yeah. Java Lang objects is one thing, but you have so if you have a one million source file line project, clearly you can divide it up in fifty cores probably, uh, fifth, one million source files. But in this case, you only have eight thousand source files. So when you split it up, too few of them are unique for that chunk. So it will recompile everything in those. So it's very busy, but it's not fast. Okay. Yeah, so so three cores is the one. Okay? Uh, if you're using custom annotation processors as part of your build, are they going to have to be updated to support? That's a very good question. And I've uh, anticipated annotation processing, but I have not implemented support for it. So the question is, the problem with an annotation processor is that you have absolutely no control of what it's doing. Hopefully, the annotation processor walks through the file manager given to it for Java C. Because if it does, it will get the file manager that I created from Smart C wrapper, which uh, collects all the output data. So it listens in and sees what's being written. So that's one way that you could capture information from the annotation. But if the annotation processor doesn't care about, then you don't know. Okay. Thanks. Oh, one more. Oh, sorry, sorry. Do you pick up dependencies between constants that have been inline during compilation? No. Uh, uh, I don't look at the class files. I look at the source. So this, it depends on another source. So it knows that it depends on that source. So if you change the constant, the dependent package will uh, change, uh, re recompile. Okay. Yeah. But uh, the ant depend task has a problem because it can't see yeah, where it came from. Yeah. OK.